From his start at Intel in 1974, he's worn the hats of engineer, venture capitalist, and most recently, chair of Kleiner Perkins. The ventures he has backed have created hundreds of thousands of jobs and become three of the world's most valuable companies. And now, he has written a book about the goal-setting techniques that have helped tech giants like Google and Intel thrive. It is called Measure What Matters, How Google, Bono, and the Gates Foundation Rock the World with OKRs. He joins me now here in the studio. John, welcome. Thank you. OKRs, objectives and key results. This is a slideshow presentation you've been doing for many, many years. Yep. Companies talk about it all the time like it's their religion. Mm. It's about setting objectives and key results. Ideas don't matter so much as execution. Execution's everything. What is so radical about this idea? Well, it's not practiced in almost every company. And what I mean by that is, take one, one feature, just the notion that everybody in an organization would write down their goals and publish them and share them transparently, that's radical in, in, in most businesses or nonprofits. And that's just one of five things that set it apart. And you say that it's not just goals being set at the top, but employees setting their own goals. Everyone right? transparently, top to bottom. So. Uh, when Larry and Sergey at Google were 24 years old, I took them this goal setting system. And I I'd like to tell you that Sergey said, yes, John, we'll enthusiastically adopt this. Uh, the truth is, he said, we don't have any better way to manage the company, so we'll give this one a try. And Emily, every quarter since then, every Googler has written down her objectives and key results, published them internally, graded them, and then tossed them aside because they don't count for bonuses, they don't count for promotions. They serve a higher purpose, a kind of collective calling and commitment to getting people focused and aligned and, and, and tracking on the stretching for the things that really matter the most. So you presented this to Google where you had just placed your biggest bet of all time in 1999, $11.8 million for 12% of the company. And Larry Page wrote the foreword to your book and he, he called it a gift. Hmm. So I'm curious, what would your OKRs be for Google today? They are grappling with artificial intelligence, self-driving cars, fake news. There's a lot of well, change that's happened well, in the last well, two decades. Well, they have a very clear and crisp set of OKRs. And if I told you what they were, I'd be leaking. So. so but everyone has them. And this quarter, Sundar will stand up in front of 70,000 employees on a webcast and say, these are our Google's objectives and key results. And here are mine personally and they won't get them all done. They'll maybe achieve 70% of them, and that's considered a great grade. Now, one of the things you say about OKR is that they're not a silver bullet. They mm. don't take the place of values or culture. Or strong management. Exactly. Can't and substitute so for those. How The book is called Measure What Matters. How do you measure something so intangible, culture? Well, uh, culture answers the question, why? Objectives answer the question, what? key results answer the question, how? Your question to me was, how do you measure culture? In fact, you do culture surveys. You draw up a definition of what your culture is, and you periodically pulse your organization to say, do you feel we're not just saying, but living up to these values, be they transparency or aggressiveness or accountability? And I've seen this, Emily. There's no one right culture. Every organization has its own and different ones can succeed in different ways. So I want to ask you about Facebook, and I know you're on the board of Google, so you can't say so much about Google, but you can opine about Facebook, and, and Kleiner was an early investor. We've seen Facebook uh, go through election meddling, also fake news problems, um, data privacy issues, data being mishandled. Um, what would your OKRs be for Facebook, or what, what would you recommend? that they do in this situation? Well, it, it's a little hard being outside the organization to, to be prescriptive about that. So, so forgive me for saying that. But I, I think uh, this is an incredibly well-run company with really good people in it. And I would expect that their internal goals, though I have no way of knowing this, are to, to achieve a certain measure of growth and engagement together with, paired with, uh, a measure of trust and user satisfaction. And the book talks about the importance of pairing goals. Uh, if you go all the way back to Lee Iacocca in the Pinto, he had, with an iron fist, goals to make the least expensive car he could. And the failure was he didn't 
pair that with a goal in and around quality. So for want of a part that costs less than a buck, when someone ran into the back of a Pinto, the gas tank exploded, 100 people died, one of the largest recalls they ever had. So if you just let your goals be one dimensional, you're gonna miss the mark. You went to the White House, you met with, with President Trump. Um, this, as you know, questions of tech regulation are looming, a potential trade war. What are your biggest concerns about sort of the economic and business consequences of this administration? So I'm a, a red-blooded patriotic capitalist who believes <laughs> in, in free markets, but also in putting a safety net in our economy. And I believe technology fundamentally advantages the rich, not the poor, and education is the countervailing force that provides for upward mobility. Uh, I, I said then, I, I, I believe now, that we should invest more in research and development, a lot more across the board, that we should take data which has been bottled up and siloed and liberated, especially in the healthcare system, and this administration is moving very smartly on that front. Uh, I'm a believer in free trade. I, I, I have differences with the administration on that. But uh, I, I think this is, a, this is a really good time for entrepreneurs to start new companies and to be working in the field of technology. I do hold uh, maybe the uh, debatable view that every company either is or is gonna become a tech company. Mm. That you can't really compete in the new connected world without understanding what artificial intelligence or machine learning can mean to the products and services you offer your customers. What is your view on artificial intelligence? Elon Musk has said it's apocalyptic. We were just talking about that. It could be. It'll turn us all into house pets. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I mean. That is certainly one view. Could it get that dark? I don't think so, but I, I want to put it in context. It seems every dozen years or so, there is a tsunami-like transformation to the innovation economy. Starting in 1980, it was the microchip in the PC, right? That takes us forward to about a dozen years, 93, 94. The next big wave was the web browser. You remember Mosaic and Netscape and all those internet companies, including all the way up to and through Google. Then in 2006, Steve Jobs introduced the iPhone. And at the same time, the cloud came along. So that was the third great wave to right about today. So fair question is, what is it now, John? And um, I, I think this field has been overhyped, but now I think it's underappreciated. And that field is artificial intelligence. It's programs that learn as they go along. It's uh, deep reinforcement learning, neural networks that mimic in some ways the ways humans think. And the effects of this are gonna be profound. We can't have self-driving cars without artificial intelligence. Uh, what we can do with healthcare is incredibly exciting to me. Uh, right now you can uh, take an image of a retina and not only predict the likelihood that that person will develop diabetes, but also the likelihood of heart incident in advance. And you can apply uh, artificial intelligence today to all kinds of imaging in healthcare and get better diagnoses than humans can give. We're just getting started. As our lives become more tech infused, do you worry about tech addiction or the negative impact of technology? I mean, Chamath mm. Palihapitiya, who worked at Facebook for a long time, has talked about the guilt he feels and how he believes it, it, Facebook could be destroying the very fabric of our society. Yeah, but, but good parenting can, can deal with this handily. When my girls were growing up, I had a personal objective to have a healthy family and a key result that's Right, and OKRs can be applied to family life, as you talked about. In fact, before we end, I want to talk about that. But my key result was to get home for dinner 20 nights a month by 6 p.m. And the paired quality result was to be fully present. So I pulled the plug on the router. Nobody could get to any, anything on the internet. and. You know, I got that, it was hard. I got it done maybe 70% of the time, which was a pretty good grade. So you're not worried? No. About the negative potential of all of these amazing things that are not Not, being not, built. not when there, there's at least one and preferably two, two diligent parents in a household. I, I do think we want to be concerned about the families and kids for 
where that's not the case. Let's talk about leadership. You know, I mentioned Elon Musk. He's obviously going through uh, production issues at Tesla. There was just an analyst call where he referred to questions as boring and, and boneheaded. He's got another company, SpaceX. I don't know, what, what, what would you recommend to a leader in, in that position, running two uh, really companies that are really pushing the limits of technology? Well, I, I, the same thing I recommend to other disruptive entrepreneurs. I mean, uh, Make sure you have a strategic focus on a large unserved market need. Bring to it a proprietary technology and a commitment to assemble an outstanding management team. Raise a reasonable amount of money. You can raise too much money as well as too little. Uh, above all, never lose your sense of urgency, which allows Tesla to move far faster than the rest of the automotive players. And I recommend you use objectives and key results. I do want to mention, you say this is much more than a book. In fact, it's a handbook. I'd, I'd like to say it's a handbook. It's not a business book because it's full of a dozen stories of real entrepreneurs and leaders struggling, succeeding to set goals that matter. But my hope is that this isn't just for businesses. I think we can take OKRs certainly to our nonprofits, but even to our families, our schools, and our government. We're, we're really at a critical moment in time where I think uh, many of our leaders and some of our great institutions have failed us. What should Trump's OKRs be? Uh, it, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't given that thought, and that's a really very good question. But I, I would, I, I would imagine there, uh, grow the economy, have the country be respected in and around the world. Uh, his, his, his objective would probably be make America great again, right? The Sorry. objectives are very important to get, so too are the key results. And, and so I, I can see us using, well, let me say this, Sylvia and Matthew Burroughs used OKRs to manage the Ebola crisis. Government is to be transparent and accountable, so why not have a city council adopt this system of goal setting? I think we can and we must measure what really matters. So. Let's talk about diversity in Silicon Valley because we are increasingly holding Silicon Valley to account when it comes to diversity and I know that you are very aware of this problem. You know, as you're advising young companies, how do you tell them how to approach setting goals and results for something that is so important but so easily is lost sight of? So the first thing I ask them to do is answer the question why. And the answer to the question why we do this work, why we're on this, is all important. And it'll reflect and be expressed in both our values and the mission statement. And you ought to have a powerful, inspiring mission, because that's going to help you get the people together to do it. Something like organize all the world's information and make it available to everybody for free, anywhere, anytime. That's pretty timeless. And Something like connect everybody in the world. So you've got to get the mission and the values right. And then this goal system, these objectives and key results. I think of those as kind of transparent vessels, the what and the how, into which we pour these values. Because it, it's, it's very clear that the transformational teams uh, have managed to combine passion with purpose mm -hmm. in, in, in a way that says, uh, they clearly know how to answer the question why we do the work that matters the most. So I just wrote a story in, in Business Week with my colleagues challenging Amazon to build its new headquarters. They're starting from scratch, 50,000 new workers, to shoot for 50-50. Is that a fair proposal? I think that's a great goal. And not so much for uh, social, uh, social equality or for, or for social progress, but because we know that diverse groups make better business decisions. The data shows it. And so, you know, until we, the tech industry, the venture industry, and Kleiner Perkins get to a 50-50 world that reflects the customers we're trying to serve, the society we work in, we're making less good decisions. So I have to ask you about your reflections on Ellen Pow in light of the Me Too movement. And obviously, you know, she sued your firm for, for gender discrimination lost in court, but public opinion maybe had, had d mixed feelings. In this new world, as we have this national conversation, what are your sort of reflections on that? 
So it's, it's hard to add much to what's been said or written, or in fact, you and I have discussed before about uh, Ellen Powell. The, I'm human, the whole situation made me very sad. I think she's doing good work now, and I really do wish her well. The, uh, I think the more important, sorry, not the more important question, I think the other dimension to this is uh, I and we should have zero tolerance for a workplace that makes anyone in that workplace uncomfortable. And on the particular question of diversity, uh, I think you know we've been a leader in this field and we don't think we've gone far enough. So there's three areas in which uh, I've been fighting really hard to make more progress at Kleiner. One of which is uh, in our own people, our partnership. The second is our portfolio. And then the third is the pipeline. In our own partnership, 21% of our investing professionals are female. The average for the venture industry is pathetic. It's 9%, as you know. Within our portfolio, 9% of our CEOs or founders are female. The average in the tech industry is 2.7%. That's outrageous. And with respect to the pipeline, in 20, I guess it was in 2015, 2015, 10 percent of the participants in the Kleiner Fellows Program, which is harder to get into than to get into Harvard, were female. This year, it's 50-50, and 11 percent of them are African American. So I'm not satisfied with where we are. I think we all have to do more. But we just have to put women in, in, in minorities in positions of power if we're going to right this wrong. So you've brought in some new blood. Mamoun Hamid uh, joined the firm. Ilya Fushin. Ilya. Wonderful talent. Uh, we've heard he's sort of your heir apparent, Mamoun is. Talk to us a little bit about the, the, the transition that's to come and how you expect the firm to change over sure. the next sure. few years. So, so Kleiner's in very good shape. I, I, I'm really excited about it. Uh, one of my key results when I, <laughs> I took on this new role was to help the team attract and grow more talent. It's important to note, though, that Kleiner has always been in transition. Since I joined it in 1980, we had partners who were in their 60s, 50s, 40s, and 30s. And so I had kind of an outsized presence, maybe externally. But this is a very natural process that I think is, is, is going well. Where do you see the biggest opportunities in venture capital right now? Crypto? <laughs> Warren Buffett just called it rat poison squared, yeah. if that's any Char context. I, I think Charlie Munger said he was transferring turds. <laughs> right. Do you think Bitcoin is a good investment or crypto in general? I think that uh, blockchain mm -hmm. is a very powerful new technology. It's not as big a deal as mobility and when I talk about these tsunamis. And I don't think it's as big as AI. But we have invested both in blockchain and the use of blockchain to facilitate international and cross-border transactions. I'd love to see blockchain applied in a powerful way to the healthcare system so that you have fine-grained control over whether your health, where your health information goes so that you can automatically at any time have a longitudinal record of all your healthcare experiences. What else? What's uh, next? We, we invested in an ICO. Uh, we'll, uh, but in tech more broadly, I mean, where do you see the opportunities in the next 10 years? I think they're in artificial intelligence. I remain convinced that uh, selectively they are in the areas of uh, innovations around energy and energy technologies. I th I'm, uh, I'm quite convinced we'll see a lot more uh, disruption in systems for enterprises. I want to say this, though. The big tech giants, especially those with strong positions in consumer markets, they're a lot more competitive than their predecessors were. And so I think it's harder to start a new consumer internet-based venture. All right. John Doerr, chair of Kleiner Perkins, out with a new book, Measure What Matters, or a handbook, we should a say. A new, new handbook. It's at whatmatters.com. All right. Thank you so much, John.